2022 års Engelsbergs seminarium har precis avslutats. Temat i år har varit Liberty, frihet. Och i passet som nu följer diskuteras att slåss för sin frihet. Med fokus på Ukrainas kamp för sitt nationella oberoende. Fighting for freedom. Robert Johnson is our first speaker. That's very nice of you. Thank you very much indeed. My fan club have turned up, which is always, which is great news. Um, some of you may know that I've, um, I've just uh, joined the British government, um, but I have to make that important caveat, which is that uh, I am not speaking on behalf of the British government. I'm here in my capacity as the director of the uh, CCW programme at the University of Oxford. Um, but I did want to take the opportunity, obviously, uh, to say thank you. One of the things we all notice about our liberties, you know, uh, over that period we had coronavirus, we were deprived of our liberty um, in Britain particularly and deprived of the ability to travel. And I think, we, you know, when you're deprived of something, you appreciate it all the more. And, and the fact that we're back here, you know, lots of people have mentioned it, um, the, the really striking thing is the fellowship um, that you experience here at Engelsberg. And I want to say thank you very much indeed for the privilege and the honour of being able to come back uh, and enjoy things with you. On a slightly more... Somber note, um, I want to take you metaphorically back in your imagination to those dark tunnels of the Avastol steelworks in Mariupol um, a few weeks ago. It was on 10th of April until the 20th of May that that epic defence, worthy, I think, of Leonidas at Thermopylae, um, against all the odds, that small garrison, um, attracted world interest in its... Uh, defence um, against overwhelming odds of Russian forces. At the very end, 53 wounded, all wounded personnel were either pulled out or carried out of those tunnels. Um, out of the 211 uh, final survivors, many of whom were also uh, wounded, they did not surrender. They were ordered to cease resistance uh, by their legitimate government. Um, and as they emerged uh, from those tunnels, they found that 95% or more of their city of Mariupol had been destroyed. And yet that epically heroic force um, of three reduced brigades, which is a polite way of saying there was only 3,000 in defence of the city in total, held up the entirety of the 58th Combined Arms Army, and in particular, the 150 Motor Rifle Division, numbering 14,000 uh, Russian troops. The big tactical error, of course, made by Russia was the one that uh, Zunzer uh, of the Art of War advised, which was, do not force men to fight from a position of despair, in other words, where they have no choice, build them a golden bridge to capitulation. The warning for us is that we must not uh, fall into the trap of capitulating uh, to uh, these uh, immoral and illegal demands by Russia. What I thought we might talk about though this afternoon is when success and survival are impossible, why is it that men and women fight on for a liberty that they may not live to see at all? There are episodes of last-ditch defence, which are the most extreme cases of human courage and endurance. Individuals are driven by powerful emotion as well as by reason. And it was the basis of that, that was the inspiration for me to put together a book some years ago um, uh, called Outnumbered, Outgunned and Undeterred, available in all good bookshops at £9.50. In that book, I, and I was you know, just impressed by the fact that we have so many examples uh, from global history of those impossible situations against all odds where people fight on. Washington's dwindling numbers of patriots um, in the winter of 1775, for example, um, held on against all the odds against a mature and experienced British army 
to win America's independence eventually. We've heard already this afternoon about Finland's winter war in 1939. Against all the odds, the Finns just would keep fighting to the end. What about Israel's famous defence of the Golan Heights in 1973 in the so-called Yom Kippur War, where Zvika Godstein and just three armoured vehicles, all of which were damaged, kept fighting on a small troop of tanks against an entire Syrian armoured division, which eventually it compelled to retreat. What about the French Foreign Legion at Camerone, um, the, the, uh, the chap with no hand, if you remember the story? Uh, they fight on to the last man of the last cartridge in 1863. And even my own regiment, uh, the old 2nd Devons, um, at the Battle of Bois de Boots on the Aisne in 1918, 427 men went into battle uh, in trenches and every single man was killed and wounded. Um, they were awarded the Croix de Guerre by the French army and the French government. And even in recent years, the old regiment still raises a toast to l'armée française uh, in memory of that commitment. Now, the most extreme imbalance, though, is when you have partisans facing regular forces who are intent on their destruction. And there are many examples in history where this has happened. So in the First World War, uh, Arab forces uh, led by or at least guided by T.E. Lawrence of Arabia, um, faced an entire Ottoman army and managed to sort of pull through towards Arab independence at the end. What about the Russian Civil War, where the Ukrainians, under leaders like Nestor Makhno, uh, fought on against overwhelming odds in the forests against Frunze and Trotsky's uh, Red Army. And then this example, so inspirational, the Second World War. Now, there are, of course, episodes where outsiders want to aid the partisans in these extreme conditions in the cause of liberty. Um, and this is particularly poignant for me at the moment because there are two British nationals who've just been condemned to death for going to the aid of Ukrainians um, in the fighting in uh, the Donbass. Now, we know that in these cases where um, we wish to assist uh, these partisans in the fight for liberty, the most effective way of doing so is the full mobilisation of regular forces, regular armed forces, that can fight alongside uh, those locals. But there are, of course, clandestine ways of aiding forces too. Special operational forces, uh, naval interdiction operations, it's good to see the Moskva go down uh, a few months ago, and uh, perhaps transmitting funds and weapons to balance the odds. And I'm pleased to announce the British government has agreed to send the M270 uh, long-range missiles in aid of Ukraine and its heroic struggle. You will all know, though, the story of the Special Operations Executive, the so-called Baker Street Irregulars, or in my favourite title, the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. Established unofficially in 1938, um, it was uh, an organisation that was going to set up to do sabotage against Nazi occupation initially of Czechoslovakia uh, there, and later this concept was extended um, throughout the entirety of occupied Europe. It wasn't just going to do sabotage, though. It was going to help establish and aid secret armies of partisans. It was so secret, this organisation, that although it occupied Baker Street in London, uh, you couldn't find it in a phone book, and all the departmental titles were disguised with boring names like Admin Department. It did, of course, this organisation spawn. It was the inspiration for OSS, which became the highly successful CIA. Unfortunately, in Britain, it was decided at the very end of the war um, that this entire uh, organisation, which had global reach, was going to be shut down in just 48 hours by a left-wing government um, of Clement Attlee. Sorry, John, had to disparage your, your hero there. Now, the key thing about applied history, though, is what, what does it tell us, this story of SOE in the Second World War? The first thing it tells us, we must get organised. Uh, one of the things that really marred the formation of this covert aid to Europeans in the Second World War was the interdepartmental rivalry uh, between MI6, the British Secret Intelligence Service, and the armed forces. It got to levels of absurdity, where there were two naval stations down in Cornwall in southwest England, one run by SIS, one run by SOE, and they were at loggerheads with each other, and MI6 tried to stop SOE from operating from its naval base. So we've got to sort ourselves out when we're going to aid our allies and friends. Now, what they did was they created three branches, 
Um, one is not very well known. Uh, it was known as SO1, or the Political Warfare Executive, derived from the Foreign Office E branch, which conducted information operations. Many of you may know the story of Operation Periwig, where German prisoners of war were um, selected and briefed that they were going to be sent back to Germany to aid a resistance movement which had grown up inside Germany. These German prisoners of war, it was known, would be flown in, dropped. It was known that they would hand themselves in to the Gestapo and say, hey, listen, I've been sent here by the British to aid this German resistance organisation. The whole thing was a canard. Britain knew there was no resistance organisation, but it tied down thousands of Gestapo agents searching for, searching for a mythical uh, in, a resistance organisation. The best man of all was Sefton Dalmer. I should have brought a photograph of this man. A rather large and sweaty individual, but he did manage to put together Nachrichten reports, mix them, them with gossip, which misleaded German troops and encouraged resistance throughout Europe. We've all heard of the Victory V symbol and wrapping out the first bars of Beethoven's Fifth. You know what I'm talking about. Now, the second branch, though, equally as famous, MIR, or MD1, uh, based in Hertfordshire and Buckinghamshire in Britain, also known as Station 11, was the group that made weapons and explosives for sabotage operations, including sticky bombs, one of the most famous things they did was they had a special detonator made out of aniseed balls inside a condom. And they found that actually it had a sort of particular regular rate of dissolving, and that was your detonator. They later changed that to a time pencil. Apparently they ran out of condoms. I wonder why. Um, but anyway, um, the third branch, of course, of SOE was the more famous SO2 and 3, um, which was divided into country sections to run sabotage uh, operations in occupied Europe and raise local forces. They trained in the uh, finest homes of England. In fact, SOE got known as the stately homes of England. Uh, that's what SOE apparently stood for. <laughs> but the th second feature, though, we need to derive from our history here is that, that we need to be ready to be ruthless. A country like Sweden, peace-loving, thoughtful, deliberative country. I'm sorry, but when you join a military alliance, you need to be ready for the hard stuff. And actually, what was really interesting about SOE is it developed its own weapon systems for close quarter battle, the most dramatic of all fighting. It developed its own explosives, some of them disguised as rats, some disguised as household objects, and other as cow dung, as a thought. So you've got to get ruthless uh, about these things. The third thing you need, though, is enlightened leadership. Um, and it was very interesting that Colonel Colin Gubbins, who took over running SOE in 1943, recruited people regarded as socially unacceptable in normal military affairs. Homosexuals, former convicts, communists, even classicists. Dreadful people. Um, and uh, those frightful Gaullist French nationalists were invited to join SOE. More importantly, though, lots of women were involved in SOE, as you know, about 3,000 out of the original 13,000 personnel. And these women operated deep behind enemy lines at a, in a time when women were not considered to be suitable for combat roles. And just to remind you, that of the 41 women on frontline operations, um, only 16 survived uh, that particular set of operations. So um, the final thing to say, though, about you know, what do we learn from this story about covert assistance is that you have to accept the odds, um, impossible though they may be. There's a very high chance of betrayal and capture. In the Netherlands, for example, all 50 members of SOE were betrayed and rounded up, and all of them were eventually um, killed uh, in either concentration camps or on the spot. In France, there was the highest chance of betrayal of all. Max Hastings once wrote that the resistance myth that was created about France um, provided some salve to the shame of the sheer scale of the numbers of people that were collaborators. But operations like Prosper, for example, uh, in France in the Second World War were destroyed by betrayal. The, luckily, uh, the most successful SOE operation probably of all was Operation Jedburgh uh, in support of the Normandy landings. And to give you some idea of the odds we're talking about here, 100 personnel were dropped behind enemy lines. In, a, in an occupied country where there were 200,000 German troops. They brought with them 4,000 tonnes of munitions over a period of many, many weeks, risking uh, detection throughout. And they delayed at least three German divisions during that crucial period of the liberation of northern France. There are obviously operations that you know of, I'm sure, in Poland, Yugoslavia, Italy 
and Greece, where SOE were the key enabling organisations for that assistance to these forces of liberation. But there were failures too, in Albania, uh, in Hungary and in Romania. Successes, though fortunately, in places like Ethiopia and West Africa and in, crucially in Southeast Asia against the Japanese. They were always most effective, these clandestine organisations, when coordinated with regular military headquarters. And that is why today, special forces are under regular military command today. So John Keegan um, once condemned the existence of SOE in a lecture in, in Britain. He said that the SOE was no more than the forerunner of modern terrorism. I respectfully submit to you that he was wrong in that judgment. Terrorism predates the Second World War, and he conflated the ideological causes and methods of these organisations as if there was any equivalence between them. Just take, for example, if we were to apply the same equivalence to armies and say that the army of America in the Second World War was no different from the army of Nazi Germany. I think we would all have issue with that, and I think we should have issue with this idea that SOE was in some way perhaps no more than a terrorist organisation. Why do people fight? in these terrible conditions of odds. Well, there are clearly the sort of, you know, sterile academic um, sort of interpretations that there were the push factors of, you know, threat and perhaps poverty or loss. And then the, the pull factors of allegiances and opportunity and survival. But I think the hard reality is, if you look at those men and women at Avostal, that these aren't things that you can reduce to nice little labels of factors. This was something existential. This was about the survival of a nation and the survival of an idea, the idea of being Ukrainian and free. When it comes to enabling others, T.E. Lawrence had some advice, famously in the so-called Article 15 of his 27 articles. He said it was not wholesome for outsiders to try to do too much uh, for local people who are fighting for their liberty. But enabling others in their liberty is, of course, a very noble cause indeed. We're famous with the biblical expression, greater love hath no man than he that lays down his life for his friends. I would say the example of Christ was actually rather more than that. Laying down your life for the life uh, of a stranger, someone you've never met before, even if they're from your own community. But these stories were stories of ordinary men and women in real David and Goliath situations who performed extraordinary feats under very specific and very intense circumstances. And as a result, the big lesson for us all is they transmit to us the character and the spirit despite all the odds and pressures. If in the extreme crisis of war, they were capable of such resilience and prowess in the name of liberty, we may reflect on how much we ourselves might achieve or encourage others to achieve when faced by extreme danger and disaster. Thank you. Oh, can you say here? No, I, I, I keep the questions. Julia Osmolovska, welcome to Sweden. As you might know, Julia comes from, <laughs> made a train trip from Ukraine to come to Engelsberg. Yes. Was there a direct train to Engelsberg, or did you have to change <laughs> some? <laughs> I had to change it for a bird, okay. so I flew here. Very nice to have you here. Yes, Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, um, thank you very much for this opportunity to address such a distinguished audience and being in such a very distin distinguished group of speakers. So I'm going to talk ab about some applied stuff, and actually it was titled in the program like Kremlin style of negotiations. However, I would change it slightly talking about Kremlin matrix of negotiations, because it's not just about the style, it is about the mindset, perception of the other side, strategies, tricks, and all the other. Let me begin with quite funny story, um, and getting back to the February um, 2022. 21st of February, so when the war started, uh, Russians were quick enough to offer to Ukrainians to launch negotiations on the third day of war. So Ukrainians were quite happy with this because before that Russians played the strategy of avoidance of any kind of communication with Ukrainian side. So what happened at this first tour of negotiations afterwards? Three members of Ukrainian delegation were allegedly poisoned by some unidentified uh, uh, staff because they had some respiratory problems and also some eye irritation. 
and the one guy from Ukrainian delegation was killed at some uh, un unidentified circumstances. So it was uh, quite a strange way of inviting Ukraine to, uh, invite, uh, to negotiations. Uh, and what was the message? So I was asked about this, and uh, there were two interpretations. First, to show uh, to Ukrainians what the Russians are going to do with Ukraine if Ukraine is not going to be negotiable. And uh, the second is... Uh, just to actually discourage Ukrainians to come for next tour of negotiations because who would die or shake hands with Russians afterwards? So basically what happened next, we had also some secret back, street, back, back channel of negotiations uh, implying some of Russian oligarchs, probably you've heard of, of uh, Mr. Abramovich in this. And allegedly he came first to see Mr. Putin after he met Delansky with some written note from our president. And when uh, Mr. Putin read this note, um, Abramovich asked him, what should I send back to Ukrainian president? And uh, the Russian president replied, tell him that I will destroy them. So that means that um, we need to decipher or to decode the Russian style of negotiations, just to understand what they really imply by that. And uh, here, Ukrainians probably are much better placed than any other country because having this common history and um, sharing some common folklore, we can actually understand what Russia, Russian means when they use this or that proverb, or we can understand what children games they play. For instance, there is a very common game uh, which is called Garatki or small towns, small cities, which means that you construct a small town out of m small bricks and then your goal is to smash it with some hard stick and the winner is those who've smashed most of these townies, of this small Garatki. So that means that Russians take destruction as entertainment. And uh, you won't know this unless you know all this folklore and you know, don't know this history. Or for instance, if uh, you are talking about such a method as bluff, Russians have a proverb, um, it's not important who you are, it is important who you show to others. So that means that uh, they're not very much interested in the substance as such, but in the perception of what they want to deliver to the others. So basically when we're talking about uh, the existing models of approaching Russians and negotiations these days, uh, from Western partners uh, we can distinguish two approaches. First is to accommodate to Russia, which basically France and Germany are trying to perform with some help of Italy. And second is uh, to put it straightforwardly, like um, take it or leave it, what Americans and our UK partners are doing. Ukrainians at the moment applying a sort of improvisation without substance. This was um, uh, the approach they used in the first part of negotiations, which actually proved to be quite helpful. However, they were not experienced negotiators. They were improvising, but actually they applied the tactics that Russians were using always, like sending mixed messages, uh, withdrawing the previous commitments, having this different level of authorities of decision makers. This actually uh, frustrated Russians a lot. They didn't know what what to expect from Ukrainian side. But um, it's not funny enough because uh, sooner or later we still end with negotiations. And the problem for us is that we need to be prepared for these negotiations with Russia and be prepared to play their game in order to overplay them. So therefore, I will give you a bit of hint what Russian metrics of uh, negotiation means with some of element of it and uh, why it is important to talk about Russian culture and all this kind of stuff. Just because these negotiations are going to be quite emotional and stressful. Uh, the studies shows that um, negotiator is 50% made of individual agenda, individual bringing up, uh, upbringing, or, and 50% of culture stuff. But when it comes to the stressful negotiations, all of the negotiators negotiator tend to perform cultural biases. So therefore, it's very important for you to know what Russian's cultural biases are. So, um, 
the basic line is that, uh, uh, and it's always mistaken by our Western partners, who actually made decisions based on theory of rational choice, which means that if you say it's rational, you offer this to your partner negotiations, he is ready to accept this because this is beneficial for you. Russian mindset is completely different. I studied psychology negotiations in St. Petersburg, and uh, uh, we do share with them a bit of this irrational thinking. So most of the decisions which Russians are made uh, based not on rational considerations, but rather on some sort of intangibles, something that you can value um, out of emotional triggers, like respect, authority, status, whatever. So it's very important to understand that only these factors play very well in Russian mindset when you deal with them. So basically, uh, second important, important stuff is perception of opponent. Uh, Russians, uh, unlike the Harvard negotiation model, when you see win-win situation and you treat uh, your opponent as potential partner, Russians tend to resort to competitive model, which is win and lose. And it's not just about me winning the bigger parts. It is about how much do you lose. I'm very much interested in how much do you lose. So this is something that Russians apply as well. And we, you need to understand this. So Russians actually enter in negotiations treating opponent as a foe, not as a partner. And uh, the strategies that they're using out of uh, uh, five or oh, seven basic strategies defined in conflict management by Thomas Kilman, they rather accommodate either to competitive model, I win, you lose, avoidance model, I'm withdrawing myself from negotiations for you not to be able to take a decision. This is something that we observed when Russians declined to talk to Ukrainians. Therefore, Normandy format stalled at some point in the past. Or the most popular model, actually, which, which they are playing right now, is um, revenge with self-damage. It means that Russians would be ready to suffer a bit if they see that the opponent suffers more. So they're ready to sustain your sanctions, they're ready to sustain business isolation, all the other discomfort isolation, but, but because they see that Ukraine suffers more, they're ready to go ahead. So, um, what are the main tools of, um, and instruments they apply? Most commonly used, it's time pressure. So, they um, either in, um, put you into very lengthy negotiations, so you're getting tired. Russians normally played with two teams on that. So, they're having one for first 10 hours, then they have another one, fresh one, for another eight hours. This is something actually what we observed with Minsk Accords. Uh, they spend uh, more than 11 hours of negotiations on the level of leaders of states. Uh, another element is they create extra need or over motivation for your opponent to get to negotiated agreement. This is something which they um, applied again with Minsk Accords, when we had Ilovaisk, when we had uh, Donetsk airport. So a lot of heavy shelling. If you can just follow what Russians are doing right now, every time we enter negotiations, we don't have interim ceasefire. We just have massive shelling of Russians, thus inducing Ukrainians to be very sensitive and be rushing into in favorable decisions. Then they also use bluff, I've already mentioned it, brinkmanship. This is very important stuff. So they tend to speculate on a luck. So they're not uh, making a sort of sorrowfully calculated decisions, but they're just putting high anchoring. So it means that their demands sometimes looks quite absurd, like we saw this with ultimatum to NATO. But this is something that they gamble on. So either it will go or to, it will not go. Also very interesting trade, personal offense or depreciation. Uh, I can uh, recall one very interesting negotiation with Russians uh, on M I MH17. The lady who was in charge of Ukrainian delegation, we're talking about some concerns, which we uh, normally know as concerns, but in Russian, uh, the word concerns could have dual meaning. The second is sexual preoccupation. So basically, Russians replied to her, we don't know what your concerns are, but basically saying, we don't know your probably preoccupied with some sexual stuff. So, and she actually got, uh, she was set aback because she didn't know how to reply to it. Uh, 
Then they have also principal agent problem. So they tend to send the lower level of delegation in order to speculate that they need some high authority just to judge uh, the final decision. Therefore, they're just creating this time lag for them not to be responsible for what they're saying. So most of the negotiators are acting as the transmitters of messages to the higher authority. Uh, and uh, changing commitments. This is very interesting stuff. Um, they can withdraw what they said previously, and one of the most notorious cases here is uh, negotiations over Black Sea fleet in, uh, back uh, in the 90s, when the member of Ukrainian delegation just incidentally spotted that Russians just changed the page at already initialed document. They just put a different page in it. And it was because of sharp eye of Ukrainian negotiators that we actually didn't get into this trap. So what I've said right now uh, drives us to the question whether it's a waste of time of negotiation to Ru with Russians. My answer would be no, it's not a waste of time, because eventually we had to sit with them. But the problem is the momentum of ripeness of negotiations. It hasn't happened so far. It hasn't happened yet, because Russians are still thinking that uh, they can achieve their goals unilaterally by heavy shelling, by more destructions, by frightening Ukrainians. Therefore, they actually pretend to negotiate. They imitate negotiations at this stage. Ukrainian side also counts on some different factors, understanding that it's not the time, not the momentum for negotiation. Therefore, my appeal to you is, Please don't press us to negotiate with Russia at this moment. It's, the moment hasn't come yet. And I am very much grateful to the position of UK, to the position of US, the Baltic countries, because they do understand uh, that there is no momentum created at this moment. And if you have this authority and influence over your European partners like France, Italy, and Germany, please convey my message to them. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, having heard what you told us, will the right moment ever come for negotiating with the Russians? Yes, definitely it will come. Um, and uh, right now, time uh, factor plays into Ukrainian hands, uh, but uh, this is not everlasting exercise. So my assessment is three, four months, and we need to generate this game changer. And uh, for Ukrainian side, game changer right now is getting sufficient amount of military assistance from our Western partners in order of us to be able to do uh, a scale counter-offensive attack and uh, then uh, force Russia to negotiate on our terms. That will take three, four months. Well, uh, it requires a very sophisticated strategy, not just on the Ukrainian side, but also on our Western partners. So far, we are doing right steps. We are negotiating with our Western partners first, not talking to Russians. Actually, they, seem, uh, they feel themselves being extremely offended by this, but actually we need to keep momentum because otherwise Russians are just uh, trying to exploit the strategy of attrition, not just in, on the battlefield, but also in political and diplomatic realm. So they count on this food crisis, intolerance to uh, energy crisis. They want to extend the war till winter time, and this will make all of us fragile. Mm. But how will you negotiate then to, uh, to avoid the Russians playing all their dirty tricks to you? We can play it back. <laughs> you didn't tell me of any Ukrainian dirty tricks. No, actually, I didn't tell a lot of this Kremlin school of negotiation uh, as a uh, methodology. But for those who are interested, I'm happy to talk on, on coffee breaks. Mm, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I welcome our next speaker, Alina Polyakova. Well, thank you so much. I mean, I think uh, Yulia's uh, talk just now was a perfect uh, prelude uh, to what I will be talking about today. So the theme of this seminar has been liberty, of course. And we've all been hearing about different ideas of the history, uh, the present moment, and now the future of liberty. And of course, no one is fighting for liberty or freedom more uh, than the Ukrainians in this particular moment. It is the greatest fight for liberty that we have seen in a very long time um, in the West. And it's not just about Ukraine. 
It's about the future of European liberty and freedom, and it's really about the future of all of our freedom across the world, because have no doubt uh, that what's happening in Ukraine is not just being watched by fellow democracies and like-minded nations, it's also being watched by the authoritarian nations, and I think we all know who we're talking about here, um, to understand the depth and the breadth of democratic and Western response to this kind of brutal infraction of human rights and human liberty in Ukraine. So what happens in Ukraine today, literally today on the battlefield, will define the future, not just of Ukrainians and the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian country, but for all of us. And I think we have to keep this in mind right now as attention spans, unfortunately, begin to linger, as Yulia said, towards energy prices and other things that concern voters across all of our countries. But I'm going to make the case here, for those of you that still need to be convinced, for why the chorus of voices that we've been hearing over the last several weeks, uh, let's call them the party of peace for the purposes of our conversation, those advocating for some sort of negotiated settlement, uh, why this is the wrong approach. Um, and again, I think Yulia's comments on the Russian a strategy of so-called negotiations and diplomacy is the perfect example as to why this is the wrong approach. But I'm going to focus on the political side of this. The basic argument from the party of peace is that Ukraine should give up some territory for peace, that this is going to lead to long-term stability and security in Europe. My point to, to you is that this is a complete illusion and a deeply, deeply misguided approach that won't actually lead to long-term peace in Ukraine, Europe, in the transatlantic space, and the world, but will actually leave us in a much more vulnerable, instable, and insecure place. Why? And I'll, three points that I'll just outline here. Point number one is that this is a huge moral hazard. Because if we look at what the Russians have been doing in Ukraine, the massive rapes, the deportation of children, uh, the mass brutality of torture against tens of thousands of civilians. Um, this is not just some passion of war that we're seeing here. This is a national strategy. And this national strategy will continue in whatever territories uh, the Russians are allowed to occupy going forward. So what does that mean for us as we're potentially trying to encourage Ukraine uh, to enter some sort of negotiations. Well, it means we have to accept those consequences of massive human rights violations, of millions potentially of people uh, going through filtration camps and all the other atrocities I mentioned. This isn't going to change when Russia occupies the territories it is currently uh, fighting for in Ukraine. Um, this kind of moral and ethical dilemma is exactly the one that we face today. So how can we be democracies advocating for human rights in so much of our diplomatic efforts and elsewhere um, while accepting the eventual reality of what some sort of negotiated settlement would lead to? The second point I'd make here is that the, where these kinds of assumptions and calls for negotiated, negotiated settlement I usually derive from some historical analogies. And I think in Europe, that historical analogy often goes back to the division of Germany uh, during the Cold War, perhaps um, to the Korean uh, armistice at the end of the Korean War. Both of these are wrong historical analogies. And here's the caveat that I'm not a historian. Um, I'm always the, the outlier in some of these uh, uh, seminars that we have um, as a sociologist. But I think it's quite obvious, you don't need to be a historian to see why this is the wrong uh, false analogy. So if we go back to what happened uh, during the Cold War with the division of Germany and the Soviet policy towards the DDR, East Germany at the time, well, the Soviets invested in rebuilding East Germany. They wanted East Germany to be the beacon of the communist state success, of state socialism, of ideology. In fact, living standards were much higher in East Germany, where, of course, Mr. Putin spent some of his formative years, um, and than they were in the rest of the Soviet uh, and Eastern Bloc states. Um, in the uh, very interesting biography of Mr. Putin by Stephen Lee Myers, he notes how when his wife at the time 
came to join him in his post at the KGB in the DDR. Uh, she was really touched because when she came home and he wasn't there, uh, he left her a bowl of bananas. And those of us who come from the Soviet Union remember that bananas were a huge delicacy that you could never get. But this was something you could get in the DDR. And that tells you everything you need to know about how much the Soviet Union invested in rebuilding um, that country. And on top of that, the Soviet Union did eventually recognize um, the legitimacy of West Germany. There was no attempt to forcefully russify the East. Um, there was uh, no attempt to destroy uh, German identity and German nationality. Um, that is, of course, not what we're seeing today. What we're seeing today is a complete destruction of the Ukrainian territories, a leveling through artillery fire, um, and a certainly lack of desire and a lack of resources to rebuild and invest in making whatever part of Ukraine Germany might occupy, sorry, Russia might occupy, um, a success. None of that will happen. So what are we left with? What will we be left with? Well, some will say, well, well, at least we'll have a frozen conflict. Now, that's not a bad outcome. We have so many frozen conflicts across uh, uh, the former uh, Soviet states. Look, look at Moldova, look at uh, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Gorno Karabakh. Um, now, look at Ukraine and Crimea. Crimea seemed like not such a bad idea, you know, relatively stable. I think for a long time, I've been trying to advocate for destroying our use of the term frozen conflict. And I think the example we see today in Ukraine makes that really um, a, a, something we should all be thinking about. Because why? F there's no such thing as a frozen conflict. If we look at where the war was launched, it was launched from the so-called Luhansk and Donetsk People's Republics, so-called frozen conflicts. Um, Crimea and the occupation of Crimea has allowed the Russian side to launch this massive blockade it has allowed them to de facto have a military base and project power across the Black Sea. These are not frozen conflicts. These are launching pads for future aggression. So what, what will we see in Ukraine if Russia occupies a greater swath of Ukraine? Well, we're going to see a no man's land, a leveled, completely destroyed area of not just human rights violations and other atrocities, but a huge zone of insecurity and stability from which the Russians will launch further subversion against whatever government remains in the rest of Ukraine, uh, both economic, political, as well as by military, kinetic force, cyber attacks, everything they've been doing so far. You know, the Russian side hasn't changed. And I think sometimes we don't listen when people tell us who they are. And we really need to listen to what uh, Mr. Putin is telling us right now and what the rest of the Russian uh, officials and state-funded media, so-called media, are telling us right now. So just to start to wrap up here, there is no end game in Ukraine yet. And Yulia was exactly right. Uh, the moment has not come. And I find that in Washington, the conversations we're having now, what is the end game? How do we get to the end game? What is the end game? There isn't one, not yet. We're very much now in the fog of war. And just as we underestimated Ukrainian capabilities and courage and commitment, and President Zelensky as well, we also overestimated Russian capabilities. And of course, both sides have now adapted. And what we're seeing today is that the Russians have learned that when their atrocities are exposed to the world, which they of course wore in Bucha and other places, that's when you get more momentum for sanctions. That's when you get actual political unity. They've learned that. So now we're not seeing all the social media. We're not seeing all the open source information about what's happening in the Donbass, in Severodonetsk, in Zaporizhia, in Kherson, and elsewhere, because they have tightened that control on information. So it's our job to understand that the war is in its early days that we are in a different stage, we're in the fog of war, where we don't know exactly what's happening on the ground. It's not the first stages of war. And this could go on, unfortunately, for a very, very long time. And instead of worrying about humiliating Mr. Putin or Russia, um, instead of worrying about provoking Russia because we're sending them uh, missile launch uh, systems that can launch missiles up to 100 meters versus 30 or 50 or 70 meters, instead of worrying about those kinds of details and very much in public, 
we should be focusing on how do we shift the balance of power so the Ukrainians can eventually negotiate from a position of strength. And to be sure, wars do end in some sort of negotiated agreement. But often, that follows a capitulation, not negotiations before defeat. And it's very clear, knowing what we know about the Russian mindset, as Yulia also described it, um, and what Russians seem to believe about the war, as far as we know. It's that the only way things will change in Russian society, and it will be Russians will have to change their own society, not us, is if they suffer a military defeat that leads to some sort of rethinking in their collective memory about this broader narrative of victimhood that has been so prominent uh, in Mr. Putin's government and in Russian society, um, and this broader narrative of imperialism. So to go back very quickly and to wrap up here to my earlier point about listening when people tell us who they are. Well, just, um, you know, I think it was yesterday, Mr. Putin told us who he is yet again on a televised interview uh, where he compared himself to Peter the Great and made the assertion that it is Russia's right to take back what b rightfully belongs to Russia. So what does that tell us about Russian ambitions and objectives? Well, you know, the Russian Empire, the Soviet Union, both imperialistic uh, entities, you know, spanned not just to Ukraine, not just to the Baltic states, Moldova, et cetera. The Russian Empire and the Soviet Union covered a much larger swath of land. <laughs> And if you were a country that belonged to either of those, the configurations are slightly different, you should see Mr. Putin's comments as a real threat because it tells us something about the level of Russian ambition. It also tells us that the idea of appeasement is an illusion. There is no appeasing Mr. Putin because as long as his ambitions remain that high, we're all at a security risk. So I think I will stop there. Thank you. So uh, the moment hasn't come. What will decide when the moment has come? Well, I think I completely agree with Yulia. When Ukraine has a decisive win and a set of strategic counteroffensives and can negotiate from a position of strength, until then, there is no point in negotiation. Mm. A few speakers have talked about August, three, four months. What is your time scale? I would not venture to guess <laughs> the times because so much depends on what we do now um, in terms of the weapons the Ukrainians receive. I mean, I'm just repeating what Yulia said because I agree with her. Um, because we have a role to play as Western societies in the trajectory of the battlefield today. But your assumption is that the balance is swinging in the f to the favor of the Ukraine, is it? I think right now it's really difficult to say. I think this is why this phase of the war is so critical. Because let's remember that the Ukrainians did fight back Russia's initial strategic uh, offensive in the military space. Hmm. And the Russians thought they were going to have a three-day special operation and take over Kiev, and that was going to be it. But that's not what's happened. Hmm. I'm going to bring up the parallel of the Finnish winter war. And the, I knew you uh, would. But I'm going to, not going to do it now because I want to introduce Corey Shocker. So you have some time to think of what you want to say. <laughs> Corey, welcome. Uh, so I have, I uh, want to start by saying how ennobling it is to be in a place and among a group of people who in a dangerous time have chosen to undertake the obligation of common defense for our Swedish and Finnish colleagues that at a time where war is occurring in Europe, you are choosing to commit yourselves to the defense of the rest of us and I think that's a beautiful thing, so thank you. I'm going to talk about the order being under strain for all the obvious reasons of the war. But, but two, two aspects of the strain that the international order, the order that all of us built out of the ashes of World War II, are under for two reasons I want to talk about. One is the rise of China, and the second is the challenge of American reliability and will. Um, I'm going to argue that the order is actually a lot more durable than we often get it, give it credit for. 
And as Alina was, as Dr. Polyakova was just saying, that the um, that our it's contingent, it depends on choices that we make. I hate this argument that President Obama always used to say that the arc of history bends towards justice, because that's only true in a narrow sense. The arc of history bends towards justice when we grab a hold of it and wrench it that direction. Otherwise, it does not. Um, and we are acting like it's the law of gravity, and that is a self-indulgence that has brought us to the point that encouraged aggression against liberty and against our Ukrainian colleagues. Um, I do think the war in Ukraine is, gonna, is an enormous test of our willingness to fight for liberty. I mean, the joyful part is seeing the catastrophic failings of the Russian military. Um, and yet, our policies are still very highly, again, as Dr. Polyakova was just saying, very highly conditioned by anxiety about being drawn into the fight itself, um, which, which is encouraging the Russians. Moreover, I think we are at risk of giving Ukraine just enough help to keep fighting and not enough help to win. And that will be both a moral and a strategic failure that we ought to be a lot more worried about than we are currently worried about. And that the end state, to answer the question you didn't pose to me, there is an end state, and it's Ukraine regaining sovereignty over all of its territory. And that in order for Ukraine to achieve that, what we are doing is not good enough. Um, we, right, like the Pentagon is celebrating sending 200,000 rounds of artillery to Ukraine. By my arithmetic, at current rates of Ukrainian expenditure, that's 33 days of artillery exchanges. That is nowhere needed, nowhere near what is needed. And that the standard we should set for ourselves is we need to give Ukraine enough help that they can cut the artery of Russian resupply because that's what's going to change the dynamic on the battlefield, make negotiations possible, and make an end state that stabilizes the international order in favor of liberty. Um, and our challenge is to provide that support and to hang together, not to accept a frozen conflict, which is a way of saying accepting Russian success. We, we need to not buy into this self-indulgent sophistry. Okay, so first, the rise of China, right? We are all besotted with the rise of China. Uh, and my own government thinks it's alternatively the return to great power competition or the pacing challenge for America's um, national security. And we come to those conclusions because if you think the metrics are gross domestic product, military spending, volumes of trade, government research and development spending, or manufacturing output, China looms enormously, right? But those are all measures that uh, exaggerate the role of population size. And there are, as my AEI colleague Michael Beckley argues, and he and Hal Brands have a fabulous book coming out in two months on the subject of what we need to do about the China challenge. Those are all poor indicators of actual power. And that if you look at geography, um, do you have... Board, do you have great neighbors like Canada and Mexico? Or do you have China's neighbors and contested borders? Um, the demography of the United States benefiting so much by talented people choosing to become Americans. Um, and the Chinese teetering on the cliff of demographic disaster because of the one China policy. Um, political institutions. Not the greatest time to make that argument for my sweet provincial country. Um, and yet, uh, still, I would rather have my country's problems than China's problems if you are talking about the maintenance of power, which takes us to the last of the better metrics, which is soft power, right? 
Um, as I told uh, somebody earlier, I worked in General Powell's staff in the early 1990s and was on the team that had to, uh, that had to uh, host the Russian military when we had our first military-to-military -military exchanges. And Powell's instruction to us was, take them anywhere they want to go. And we were all wringing our hands that they were going to want to go to Offit and look at the nuclear alert stuff. They wanted to go to Disneyland, my friends. <laughs> like, this is why free societies underestimate the magnetism and the likelihood and the endurability of the liberal order, because that attractiveness um, matters hugely. The last thing I will say about overestimating China's rise. Anybody know what per capita GDP in China is? I'll tell you, $16,842. That places them behind Iraq. That places them behind Botswana. That puts them slightly ahead of the Dominican Republic. We are besotted with the notion of a stampeding, successful China. And for a whole host of reasons that I'll be glad to talk about in questions, what we are actually looking at are the problems of a stalling China. And that may actually be much more dangerous to us than a successful China is. Second uh, reason the order is under strain, uh, what John Bu earlier today described as the rowdy democracy. Uh, and I love that, uh, the rowdiness of democracy. That's a perfect example of my sweet provincial country. I would say that um, I, I do despair in transatlantic conversations when our European allies believe there was this mythological time when the United States w was governed by statemen rather than tawdry politicians. And, you know, we stood astride the world as a colossus. And I have to tell you, I keep looking for that America, and I don't see it anywhere in American history. Right? 1954, arguably the apogee of American statesmanship. You have the American military forcibly integrating schools in the American South. You have the McCarthy hearings going on. Uh, and you have the President of the United States having to threaten our European allies that unless they agree to the rearmament of Germany, we will have an agonizing reappraisal about whether we're going to care about European security at all. Right? The United States you are looking at is actually that mythological United States. We just forget about it because uh, we're tiresome in the present. My favorite description of America was given by a British historian in 1923, Bertha Ann Reuter, who said, Americans are a people so extreme in politics or religion or both that they could not live in peace anywhere else. <laughs> and that is who we were, and that is who we are. We are a disputatious, risk-tolerant country that just had a million people die in a pandemic when you had vaccines that we invented freely available to the American public, and 30% of my fellow Americans won't take it. That's who we are, my friends, and that's who we've always been. So um, uh, my favorite article ever written about the American foreign policy is by the uh, journalist for The Atlantic, James Fallows. And he wrote it when he came back after being the correspondent in Beijing for five years. And it's about the role of the Jeremiah in American foreign policy. Jeremiah is, of course, you know from the Bible. Uh, always feared he was failing God, which was why he was beloved of God. And James uses that as the metaphor for American foreign policy. We're dumb, lazy, and complacent until we realize we are failing and somebody else is succeeding. And then we mobilize ourselves out of our self-indulgent lethargy um, and, and do what needs doing. Parenthetically, if you don't read The Onion the satirical newspaper, it's the best insight into actually American culture, who we are. And three weeks after the September 11th attack in 2001, 
The Onion ran a headlight saying, Americans yearn to return to pointless bullshit. (laughs) And and that, of course, that's true of us. Um, But I think what you see now in my country is the gears beginning to mesh, a realization that the liberal or that we have been too inattentive to the cause of freedom, to the strengthening of the liberal international order, and we gotta get our act together because the world's proving to be a very dangerous place. Um, And uh, back to the soft power point, I think, you know, we're having a big debate about China now. What we are not debating, China's a danger to the international order. China's a danger to our values, to our beliefs that people have rights and they loan them in limited ways to governments for agreed purposes. And that we actually have to do what John Bew said we had to do, which is mobilize a coalition of free countries to take concerted action to preserve an order that has produced our prosperity and our security. And by the way, has also produced produced the prosperity and security of our adversaries, including China. Um, uh, And I think we're not just focusing on China, right? There are some uh, tiresome American pundits uh, like Elbridge Colby who would argue that the United States should ignore Europe because Europe can take care of Europe and China's the only challenge we ought to worry about. And that's a dumb argument for 37,000 reasons, but the main reason I will tell you it's a bad argument is that it is no secret that our European allies are our closest friends in the world, the people who share our values most profoundly. And if you think any other American security guarantee is going to be reliable if the United States doesn't care about Europe, nobody's gonna believe it anywhere. And so for the purposes, even of the reliability of our allies, we've actually got to do the right thing for stabilizing the security of Europe. And that means coming to the assistance of Ukraine. $40 billion in American um, assistance. Uh, The economic innovation of pulling everybody together and sanctioning central bank assets, for example. We are probably, all of us, gonna find a way to uh, use Russian central bank assets that are in our coffers for the reconstruction of Ukraine. Um, And, well, we should. What I would say I most worry about um, is for security of the United States and the liberal international order is our tendency to indulge in facile, self-indulgent nonsense Let me just give you two examples. Um, One is that military force cannot solve this problem, right? We say that all the time, and that's nonsense. Military force is solving this problem in the Ukraine. It will be the solution if Russia wins. It will be the solution if Ukraine wins. And we need to not blanch from that truth. Second, uh, self-indulgent nonsense. The way we are congratulating ourselves, the American Defense Department, at the moment, just yesterday I had somebody tell me that there's never been a logistic success like all the stuff we're sending to Ukraine, 17 flights a day. That is not enough. And so it's the wrong metric that nobody's ever done it to this standard. The right metric is the standard isn't high enough. And that, my friends, is uh, where we come back to having to figure out how to dig into our self-indulgent societies and win the argument with my mother that she should risk her two grandsons for the defense of Ukraine, because sooner or later, that's where we're going to be in this. Thank you. China is not helping its ally, Russia, in Ukraine. What can be said about this? It is true. Uh, Despite the Treaty of Unlimited Friendship, China is not providing weapons or soldiers, both of which the Russians evidently asked for. And they are limiting their bank's willingness to 
uh, provide loans to Russia. And it looks to me like the main reason they are doing that is because they fear the reach of secondary sanctions by the recklessness of the United States Congress, which will destroy China's ability to keep its economy growing. Mm -hmm. Will China attack Taiwan? Uh, I think not, for two reasons. First, because um, we are now focused on this problem, right? The, the Paycom's doing war games that we lose because we're testing the limits of what we need to be doing differently. Uh, my organization, the American Enterprise Institute, has a book coming out later this month, a series of essays on what it would actually take to defend Taiwan and why we should buy it, exercise it, uh, perform to it. So you can see the gears meshing of the United States getting serious. The second th reason um, is that I, my assessment is that the Chinese leadership is actually much more risk averse than the Russian leadership is. And what I believe I see in the pattern of Chinese behavior across the last 20 years is they will take a small step, a salami slice. They will build an, an artificial island and wait to see if we do anything. And then they'll put an airstrip on it. And then they'll make that airstrip militarily capable. But they do it in small increments. And we have not been doing the right things to deter their continued use, just as we had not done the right things after the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2014.